Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this virtual book launch of uh, John Kampfner's new book, Why the Germans Do It Better, Notes from a Grown-Up Country. Uh, my name is Mike Hartley, publishing director and John's editor at Atlantic Books. Uh, I'm sure John needs no introduction to most of you, uh, but suffice to say, his illustrious career means he's the perfect author for this book. Um, starting as a foreign correspondent based in Germany, including during the fall of the war, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, he would go on to become chief political correspondent for the Financial Times and editor of the New Statesman. Uh, there can be few people better qualified to compare British and German public life. Uh, I'm very pleased to say we've got an excellent turnout tonight with uh, over 160 of us uh, attending. So many thanks for finding the time to uh, celebrate with us. And yes, this is a celebration as well as a book launch. Uh, as I'm delighted to report uh, that John's book will be entering the uh, Sunday Times bestseller list this weekend. Uh, we've had some fantastic reviews already, including from Max Hastings in the Sunday Times, who called it excellent and provocative, a passionate and timely book. Likewise, it received hearty praise from Oliver Moody in the Times, who called it thoughtful, deeply reported and impeccably even handed. The only black mark so far has been from The Telegraph, uh, who dubbed the book Brexit Revenge Porn. But then again, even that bad review was deliciously quotable uh, and full of grudging praise. Uh, when John and I first discussed the book in early 2019, at a time when people still met and had lunch in the outside, um, little could I have known how timely the book would become. Yes, Britain was floundering in Brexit hell. And yes, Germany looked like a beacon of sanity in a world going astray. However, the country looked set to enter recession and people were starting to question whether it was sclerotic and bureaucratic, outpaced in a fast moving world. How wrong such doubters have been proven. The COVID crisis more than anything has highlighted the merits of a slow, honest, consensual and deliberative approach to decision making without flashy, but ultimately empty rhetoric. But this book does far more than point scoring against a Britain in political crisis. At its core, this is a nuanced and affectionate portrait of a country that has come an extraordinary distance over the past 50 years. And I think it is that deep empathetic understanding of the country that will guarantee this book endures for many years to come. And it couldn't have happened to a nicer man. John has been a huge delight to work with and he richly deserves the huge attention that the book is already getting. In terms of the format tonight, we're very lucky to welcome Katja Adler, the BBC's Europe editor, who was also formerly the BBC's Berlin correspondent as well. She'll be in conversation with John about the book. After this, you'll also have an opportunity for some questions yourself. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. So please feel free to use this uh, as we go along rather than all at the end so we avoid a massive rush. Uh, also, uh, please feel free to comment about the book on Twitter uh, under the hashtag uh, the Germans. Uh, and also please remember to tag uh, John and Katya in that as well. Um, finally, before I hand over to John himself, I'd like to uh, remind you that Waterstones have kindly offered a discount on the book. If you order it tonight from them, uh, you can use the code Germania to get a four percent, a four sorry, a four pound discount off the cover price. Uh, you may notice if uh, you uh, you'll say see that it's slightly out of stock at the moment, but that will be rectified very shortly. We've had uh, incredible demand for the book as it's been doing so crazily well, and um, it's coming back into stock tomorrow with our first of many reprints. Uh, so I think that's all, and I'm now delighted to uh, hand over to John himself to say a few words. Thank you very much indeed, Mike, and hi everyone. It's really weird. All I'm seeing, um, apart from Mike and Katia, is a big green button, and I'm looking at the green button, but behind the green button there are all of you, um, friends, family, um, from so many places. So thank you all hugely for coming. It's an incredible turn out. It would have been lovely to have had some typical publishers, warm white wine and crisps um, at a bookshop, but we haven't been able to do that. I have actually brought um, my own uh, very, very nice um, large glass of German Weissburgunder from my local uh, London um, off license. And so I will be drinking that very slowly. You'll be pleased um, to know. The one advantage, obviously, of digital, uh, of w which we now got very used to, is that it enables people, wherever you are, um, to tune in. And we have people from around the world, from the United States to Poland, Austria to France, Mexico to Spain, 
uh, and of course uh, a lot of people from the UK and I'm completely delighted um, a lot of people um, from Germany so um, I'm really grateful for you all to come uh, for coming and thanks for the incredible reviews there have been so many um, and really considered articles really lovely one in the economist and the new statesman uh, recently the tweets the emails the texts I've been really overwhelmed by the by the response I've been surprised by it by 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 the plaudits the positivity uh, and um, and the coverage um, it matters to me uh, that this book is doing well of course that's what all authors um, strive for but it matters I would say just as much even more perhaps that a debate is being had about the issues that the book talks about about competence, about social compassion, about social trust, about what it takes for countries, societies, governments to function well. And I know that Katia will, will curate that. I'll be doing a number of uh, further events, discussions and interviews uh, in coming weeks and months, both uh, here um, in the UK and in Germany, where I will be back in about 10 days time. You can't see each other, you can't see the list, but um, Mike and Jamie and team will circulate a list of uh, participants, hopefully tomorrow. If you bear with me just briefly, um, so, uh, a short uh, list of thanks. Um, thank you hugely to my agent, Andrew Gordon, with whom I've worked closely for 15 years and more since he was my editor for Blair's Wars. A huge thanks to the team at Atlantic, with whom I'm working for the first time. To Kate, our amazing publicist, to Gemma, Alice, Jamie and others, all battling through this difficult time that everyone has faced during COVID. To Will, who runs a great show. Uh, and of course, to my editor, Mike, who you've just heard from. I'd like to thank the many dozens of people who have helped me with this book. Some are Germans, some are Brits, some are from elsewhere. Um, some are here in the UK, some are over there in Germany. Some I've known for years, stretching back to my postings in the mid late eighties, Others I've met for my first time during my year of travels back in the country in 2019 for this book. You're all in the acknowledgements, or at least I hope you are. Um, and there are a dozen or so friends who went even further, introducing me to people, reading several versions of the manuscripts, putting me up and, and putting up with me. Um, so many of you are here tonight, and I couldn't have done any of this without you. This is my sixth book, all the way through, through all my journeys, I've been supported by my wonderful wife, Lucy, and my uh, wonderful daughters, Alex and Constance, who are watching from other screens in other places. And it was Lucy's idea that I should write this book about Germany. So thank you to you, Lucy. Two final quick thank yous to my amazing research assistant, Sam Fitzgibbon. Sam is an Anglo-German Italian prodigy. He not only dug out fascinating material, he set up meetings and he read countless scripts, always providing spot on suggestions. I'm hugely indebted to you, Sam. Last and now first to you, Katia, for agreeing to do this in conversation. With so much going on, I, I wonder why. It's really, really kind of you. I'm looking forward to our conversation. It sounds like Eurovision, but I'll say it. Good evening, Brussels. <laughs> Good evening London and Madrid or wherever anyone else is in Spain or anywhere around the world and thank you very much for joining us um, this evening. You mentioned uh, your, your wife Lucy John so let's start with your better half and say why is it that she, she said to you to write the book now? I mean what, what, did, you, what did you both feel was missing about you know, the conversation around Germany? Um, that you felt that now, because it's described part memoir, part history, part travelogue, you could have written this at another time. So why now? Really, really good question. The, the time felt right for me personally, Katia. Um, I, I've always felt sort of unfinished business with Germany. It's, um, you know, uh, the place incredibly well. It's both endlessly fascinating, not very well understood. Um, it struggles sometimes unless there is a huge moment, the Berlin Wall, um, financial crisis, um, the migration crisis. It sometimes struggles to get onto the news. It's kind of seen as that sort of plodding, um, rather sort of 
um, getting on with it type of type of country. And yet, when you when you unpick it, when you when you slice the layers, and you know how absolutely fascinating the country is, that is what I wanted to uncover for a British audience and for other audiences around the world. But I also wanted, in some ways, even though this book is in English and a German version will come out next year, I also wanted to direct the book also at Germans, which is to say, you're a hell of a lot better than you think you are. Um, you have so much to be proud of. And yet, because of your war history, because of the refusal to look backwards, um, you quite often um, deliberately try to keep yourself in a shell, um, not to, to, to very much keep yourself under wraps. And this is really my exhortation to Germany, which I'm sure will develop with you and, and in questions, which is the world is crying out for guardians of liberal democracy. The world is more threatened now and this isn't just a Brexit point. Brexit, in my view, has always been a manifestation of a problem, not the cause of a problem. Um, and who is going to, now we have a, a Donald Trump um, on the rampage, who is going to look after liberal democracy? And I say, step forward, Germany. We'll get to that um, in just a moment. But first of all, to the title, John, because it's, it's provocative. It's provocative whether it's aimed at your British audience, and we, we will be discussing about the often difficult relationship that Britain has had with modern Germany. Um, and it's provocative for Germans, because as you just said, for many Germans, they don't want to be in the limelight. They're reluctant to push themselves forward. They're horrified uh, at the thought of coming across uh, as arrogant on the world stage because of that weight of their history behind them. So your prodding and poking with, with the title, why, why do Germans do it better? Especially, you know, when people would think about two world wars uh, and the Holocaust, as well as Angela Merkel and Vorsprung durch Technik. Yeah, and I say in the introduction of the book, the initial responses I got from Germans, whether they were sort of CEOs of companies or, or top politicians or just old mates, and I would tell them, oh, this is the title and subtitle, of uh, the book I'm planning to write. And they would say to a man and woman, das können sie nicht schreiben. You know, that you can't, you can't write that, you can't say it. Um, you know, it's just uh, unimaginable that anybody could write uh, uh, a title like that or even think it. And so that was, I mean, it's partly to, to flog books. You know, you want a provocative title to, uh, to grab attention. I also really want to praise Mike and team for the brilliant graphics on the cover. I just think it really uh, illuminates um, the words uh, really, really well. Um, so it was partly that. I hope people see the book as nuanced, and I'm really pleased that a lot of the reviews pick that up. This isn't a hagiography. I do say a lot, these are the problems with Germany. Some of them are the, are the little niggly day-to-day -day ones, and some are big picture, economic, foreign policy, political ones. But it is very much, as I say, a um, look at this country, you guys, you Brits, you Americans, and see what you can learn from it and learn from Germany's humility. Because what we have in Britain is no shortage of hubris, no shortage of rural Britannia, arrogance and looking back at past glories. But why don't we just pipe down a bit and learn from the quiet competence of someone else? Um, you in the book you look at uh, well Germany's about to have its 150th birthday right isn't it and yeah. and, um, and you divide the book into sort of four main periods thematic periods for you um, uh, which I hope you'll just tell us about in a second but you were there at one of those key periods the fall of the Berlin Wall the birth of modern, modern, modern Germany when yeah. East, East and West um, came together. How much about that time in Germany, full of idealism, sort of, you know, a, a, a bloodless coup, if you like, a coming togetherness, has, has sort of dictated your view of Germany now? Do you see Germany through those spectacles? 
Um, I'm sure I must do. Um, I, I haven't really sort of thought of it in that extent, but you must be right. I mean, that period, I, I uh, started off in Bonn, which is as sleepy as it could get, and nothing was changing and nothing was moving. Um, and, you know, small town in Germany, it, you know, the name was, was made for it. And then moving to East Berlin to be the Telegraph's first, turned out to be the last, um, correspondent to the GDR. I still have my old press card, my press Ausweis, you know, um, from the GDR. Um, I know a lot of people like to say, oh, it was all inevitable. It was all going to implode, uh, East Germany and the, and the communist system. It, I, I didn't feel it. I mean, I, I was part of the demonstrations. Um, I write uh, in some detail about the Gethsemane church uh, in the now um, uber hip Prenzlauer Berg, but it certainly wasn't like that at the time. And we were all surrounded by the um, people's police and it all turned out people, yeah, people got beaten up and, and jailed and it was pretty unpleasant. But only uh, days earlier, Egon Krentz, the, um, uh, one of the leading um, East German figures who then went on to uh, become briefly leader, was praising the Chinese solution. He was praising Tiananmen Square. And it was absolutely, we could do historical counterfactuals as much as you like, not inevitable that this was all going to happen peacefully. Not only was uh, 89 going to happen peacefully, but that unification was going to happen peacefully. And so much is written, so much breast beating is done in Germany and by Germans about the mistakes that were made on unification and subsequent to unification, the arrogance of the Vessies, um, the absorption of one country to another without any heed of the positives that, and there were a few in the GDR, the, the uh, women's rights were much stronger as one example in the GDR. And yes, it was steamrolled through and mistakes were made, mistakes were made in the privatization. But again, I think this is excessive German self-criticism. It was remarkable. And what other country could have achieved um, what happened in that period with so little bloodletting uh, and now 30 years on and I know economics isn't everything but the pro capita GDP of East Germans is more than 80 percent of West Germans and is heading for parity by 2030 and this is the sting in the tail the per capita GDP of East Germans is higher than the per capita GDP of many people living in the north of England. Um, the reason I asked as well is because I wondered whether one could ask, being there in, in Germany at such a heady time as that, as that was, whether it left you a little bit starstruck. And I ask again yeah. Because, yeah. because in sort of response to you, do the Germans do it better? Um, I've put the question to some of my German friends actually leading up to, to, to coming here with you um, this evening. What rubbish and, they said. No, not because they recognize, they recognize strengths, but then I get, I, I got a litany uh, of yeah. why the rest of the country is, uh, sorry, the rest of the world is lulled into this sense of, you know, respect for Germany. Uh, for example, you know, we, we see Angela Merkel as wanting to safeguard the European Union and the international world order. Uh, one person I was talking to said, you know, this is all for Germany's benefit. German, Germany only does things for its, for its own benefit. It needs the EU, it needs the international order. And you pick up on this point yourself in the book because it can't then go back onto its own yeah. glorious past, if you like, because of the world, because of the troubled past uh, that it has. Um, inside the EU, Germany points a finger at Russia uh, and at China, but privately it's building a, a, you know, a gas pipe from Russia yeah. to get cheap gas. Uh, yeah. It's exporting massively to China, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, these are Germans who are putting points back to you that they feel that even some of the very big sort of plus points of their country, if you like, of modern day Germany is actually in their own self-interest, European enlargement, the Euro currency, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they're all very legitimate points and I wouldn't disagree with any of them and, and plug plug I've just done a, a comment piece for tomorrow's times which is looking at the relationship between Merkel and Putin uh, in light of the awful poisoning of Alexei uh, Navalny um, and Merkel's I mean the absolute horror 
And I think it is a shame and a scandal that uh, Germany has persisted with the Nord Stream pipelines. And what Gerhard Schroeder did as chancellor in cozying up to the Russians, getting his well remunerated perch with Gazprom and then Rosneft and, and leading the shareholders committee of um, Nord Stream was truly astoundingly shocking and should have created a much bigger scandal in Germany than it did. That said, we've got nothing to be proud of here. The, um, it has been much picked upon the um, extent to which our leading politicians, uh, the City of London and elsewhere, are completely in bed with uh, rich Russians and by extension with the Russian state. So we've got no lectures, but I think it's uh, to, to impart, but I think it is a fair criticism. The um, snuggling up to China, that has begun to change. Uh, the German version of the CBI, the BDI, did a report, as you know, uh, a year or two ago, uh, talking about uh, competitive uh, uh, China as now uh, the new competitive rival and competitive systems and undermining the Mittelstand, the German, uh, the heart of the German economy, the medium sized businesses. Um, but again, um, Merkel initiated sanctions across the EU with a number of countries that didn't want it when Russia invaded uh, Eastern Ukraine and annexed Crimea, and she's held it together. And I think in the light of this poisoning, and the Germans were the ones who got Navalny out, um, I think we're gonna see more of that. One other point, Katya, just on the sort of, am I romanticizing stuff? And I think it's a very fair question. Um, but sh immediately after leaving East Berlin, I was sent by, the, by my paper, The Telegraph, um, then, to Moscow to report on what turned out to be the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and, and the collapse of communism. Um, and that's where I met my wife, Lucy, um, uh, outside uh, the, the now Russian church where Pussy Riot um, did its thing, which was then a swimming pool right next to the Kremlin. And um, uh, those three years was, that I reported, 91 to 94, um, were astonishing we were, talk about feeling uh, bowled over by a place. That Russia was a place where, place where towns and cities were opening up, where people were finding a new language. They were finding the ability to think, to criticize, to travel for the first time. The place was blossoming. There were many problems too, but the place was blossoming. And I think there's a legitimate um, question I could ask myself about am I actually comparing the German experience with the Russian experience because I'm horrified by Russia now and I've been horrified by Russia for many many years not just the hold that Putin has but the extent to which old friends acquaintances people I knew have been completely seduced by bling basically by you make money and you zip up um, and you know what's what's good for you. And I think Russia um, had a great opportunity to, to blossom and it didn't take it. And Germany and East Germany did. And of course, there are many problems, but it's a totally different story. And so having a look at Britain, because um, you, you do make the comparison quite a lot in, in, um, in your book, and I feel very much having you know, studied German and knowing Germany very well, going to, uh, to Germany for the BBC, I, I remember going around to the editors of all the different programmes before I set off you know, much earlier in my career. What would you like to hear from Germany? You know, what is it that you feel you're not getting from Germany? I was yeah. told, oh, Kat, you know what it's like. Oh, it's kind of, it's dull, but something we have to do, the economy, uh, maybe a Nazi story. And I thought, yeah. you know what, I'm going to go and find something else. I'm going to find a different face of Germany. Um, something, as you mentioned, that, that's often unexpected, whether it's the clubbing scene uh, or sense of humour, 
um, or I found out that Berlin was the second largest tango capital in the world uh, after Buenos Aires. Damn, um, I didn't put that in. Yes. And again, though, a, a UK friend of mine said, oh, is it like sort of the arms out stomping tango that looks like a Nazi stomp? I was like, actually, no, it's the Argentinian tango, which is pretty much as close to having sex with your clothes on as you can get in, in, in public. Um, but it was this it was just this perception um, of Germany. I, I found that in the UK, it's COVID-19 that has really, for the first time, where I have felt in the UK a clear, pure admiration for how things are being done in Germany without any of the rancor or sort of references back to world wars or, or so on. Do you find that too, that it's really now? Yeah, totally. Look, when I started writing, thinking about this book, um, which was in late 2018 and started to work on it in 2019, early in 2019. You know, I wanted to write this book. We've really talked about why. Um, I, and I wanted to spend some time in Germany. Um, and I hoped it would do well. I had no idea it would crack into the bestsellers. It would be talked about the way it has been talked about, getting bids all the time from... Ameri not just German media, American media, Dutch media, all those things. Um, and I'm completely gobsmacked. And I felt, as COVID went on, um, and I don't want to be glib here, so I'll choose my words carefully, um, that something was happening. I mean, when you listened to the Today programme, where you've uh, been presenting uh, only a few weeks ago, back in March, April, May, June, uh, 10 past eight main political interview. It was al almost always the first question to a government minister, why aren't you doing it like the Germans? Um, you know, they're doing it, whether it was on the, the specifics of PPE or track and trace or the number of uh, beds or quarantine or whatever. Now, this book doesn't go into a huge amount. I think people sort of covid it out and there's going to be some amazing books on the specifics and the rights and the wrongs of COVID treatment in this country and everywhere else. But I obviously refer to it uh, in, in several places. But something happened during that period when um, people could see in, in a way that wasn't sort of esoteric. It was right in front of them that here was a country, uh, and it wasn't just Germany, New Zealand, Finland, there were a lot of countries that were, that were, uh, they, were they were all run by women, um, which is um, uh, a, a matter of, of much uh, discussion. Um, but there were a lot of countries that were dealing with it better. They tended to be countries where uh, they prized efficiency over rhetoric. I mean, you knew in Britain that something was going wrong, was going to go wrong when a government minister said, and we're introducing a world beating, dot, dot, dot. Everything was world beating. Within two days, it had been abandoned or reversed or, or, or altered. Um, and so it was COVID that, um, and it wasn't just, what are they doing better? This is what I'm trying to unravel in the book. Uh, it's not just what were they doing better in terms of the specifics of healthcare, and I'm not a healthcare expert in, in any shape or form, but it's what is underlying in society, in, in the way they do politics, that enables um, them to be better organised. And it's not just organisation, there was also compassion. I thought Merkel's TV address, which was quite a rare thing fairly early on, was extraordinary. She basically told people, this is what I know. This is what I don't know. This is what my scientists know. This is what they don't know. This is what we're doing. This is what we're going to see. And we'll see, we'll see what happens. It was so sort of straightforward. No and absent, absent of all of the war rhetoric that we were yeah. hearing uh, in the UK and France from Macron as well. Yeah, absolutely. It was just that quiet doggedness. Uh, which can often be unattractive or certainly unattractive for a journalist um, that wants fireworks. But it, it really, you know, and it was, it was a, a politics around results rather than announcements. It's a politics around uh, consensus rather than scoring points, rather than boy, binary conservative Labour, Labour conservative. Um, it has a much more developed... Uh, 
um, and to a degree codified relationship between the central government and the regions, um, which was incredibly important. Um, other aspects uh, of the way the economy was run, the concentration on engineering and high skills enabled things to be recast in, in, in terms of uh, COVID PPE much more quickly. So it was what, what, what was so important for the book was not the specifics of COVID response, but what was underlying in society. And I just hope that we, we learned from that because whether it's another uh, health scare or whether it's uh, the climate emergency, we in the UK and in the US and in other countries need to build a body politic that's more resilient but is also so much more based around the merits of competence. Um, John, I'm aware of time and I would like to kind of wang on as one of my favorite verbs um, out there about Germany and uh, you know I want migration crisis, life after Mutti, Angela Merkel, what happens, will she go and so on but I I'm going to just keep it to two more questions of mine because there are others, people who want to, 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 to talk to you. Brexit, I cannot not ask you. What's that? Well, yes. um, what I remember first starting to, to work in, in the German speaking world in the, in the 90s was the respect that Germans and, and Austrians, I worked in Vienna for a long time, had for um, the UK Parliament, um, for the, the political system, for the cut and thrust of, of British politics compared to the more consensus-based, quieter politics of, of, of Germany, and um, for the free press and, and putting truth to power. Mm. And there came Brexit. And the, I'm interested to know whether you think that, never mind that the British relationship towards the Germans, but whether the German relationship and attitude towards uh, Britons um, and, um, has changed, uh, as a result of not just the Brexit vote, but actually what happened after the Brexit vote. Um, because, you know, the, I think what I keep hearing is, we thought you were the country of keep calm and carry on and the stiff upper lip. Um, the country voted in 2016, and then to Germans seemed to fall apart afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, folks, I've just seen on the screen that my sort of screen's all kind of got lots of weird lines behind me. I don't know if that's my screen, whatever. It looks like it looks like the rays of sunlight are beaming on you. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. Good I, look. I, it's I, a good I've look. I've got these spotlights, which I probably don't do things in the evening <laughs> very much. So apologies, everybody. That wasn't some sort of weird um, visual construct, but uh, I hope it's not distracting from from the conversation. And um, I think I mean Germans were never. I, I, I um, cite an example of. John Gummer, then Environment Secretary under John Major, inviting Merkel when she was his counterpart um, in the, uh, just before the Blair government in mid-90s mid um, to visit uh, him and his wife um, in Suffolk. And uh, long story short, she was completely uh, staggered by the anti-German war rhetoric, anti-European pub talk. He took her to his local and he, uh, regretted taking her to um, his local and she said to him I now realize the task you guys face so I don't think any German and you've come I mean Katja you are you know you are the the doyen you, you know everything about uh, Brexit on both the European side and, and the British side so it's a bit weird me talking back to you on Brexit but um, just for for what it's worth Germans were uh, or ne never under any illusions about the British approach to uh, British public opinion on, on Europe. Uh, they, I think they convinced themselves, as did most people uh, elsewhere and, and many here, that uh, the vote would be for Remain. Um, they were surprised and a little shocked when it happened. But I think what shocked them far more was not the result, but what then ensued. Three years of complete self-implosion and chaos and they just couldn't understand it they kept on saying to me but i don't understand who decides you know does the referendum have precedence does parliament have precedence does the speaker decide this does the prime minister decide this and i used to say search me uh, well they said what do you mean I said we just make it up as we go along um you know got to the courts you know could parliament be pro it was complete chaos and they couldn't understand that uh, both in terms of their own nature, but also in terms of how could any country go into a decision as important as that with no backup plan 
and with no procedure. Had it happened in Germany, and it wouldn't have done because Germans don't do big referendums, um, and they wouldn't have voted that way, uh, one assumes. But let's just say they had it happened there. You have had immediately a cross-party, all-party commission charged with coming up with a solution to the problem within six months. That would then be debated in Parliament for three months, and then a consensus would be achieved on what is this kind of Brexit, and then Article 50 would have been invoked, and yes, it would have been a result that would have led to departure from the EU, but it would have been done in an orderly manner um, without this, this hubris and this brinkmanship. And they just couldn't get their heads around the chaos. And I was saying to them, you have to understand it's not, to repeat the point I made a little bit earlier, Katya, in my view, it's not the cause of anything. Britain has a, an atrophied political non-system in which we bounce from one crisis to another. I mean, we went to war in Iraq in 2003. Whatever one's views of the war, we didn't even know if Parliament had the right to vote on it. And then Gordon Brown changed the law that if we were to go to war in future, Parliament would have a final say. So it's a country that has stumbled in its sort of, well, we did it well in the past and we wave our little plastic flags um, so everything will be all right in the future and, and who won the war anyway. Um, in that way, we stumble from one thing to another. And I think Brexit was our comeuppance. And I think what has happened with COVID just reinforces this point that somebody, and I don't know who that's going to be, it's not going to happen now, has got to take a cold hard look at the way we govern ourselves uh, and pretty much start again. It does come across very um, strongly in your book, um that you are upset about the Brexit vote and that you are not happy with the British political system as is or, or the current government. That's not the discussion for tonight. Um, my next question was going to be, but I see Sir David Liddington is, is asking it, so I, I, will, I will take the question from him. Um, in terms of willingness uh, to exercise leadership in international affairs, to what extent is the younger generation of German politicians and officials willing to shed historical inhibitions or is it likely that after Merkel Germany will become still more cautious and I would add to, to uh, David Liddington's point there your your book is called why the Germans do it better notes from a grown-up country but is Germany grown up when it comes to foreign policy on the world stage that's uh, just as an addendum yeah um, it's um, well thank you and, and hello David and um, David actually wrote a, a really um, uh, lovely line uh, when he was uh, endorsing the book, sort of saying that I had um, sought to illuminate uh, Germany, uh, including its imperfections. And um, I, do, I, I do seek um, to do that. Um, Germany has been cocooned. It has, ha it has um, sat in a feather bed produced by the post-Cold War settlement um, by um, allied forces in the country, and most particularly um, by the United States. And it is a very, very, and the argument is far more interesting than this question of does, uh, is Germany stepping up in, in terms of spending 2% of its GDP on, on defense. Um, to what degree will Germany and the younger generation embrace the fact, and this is in some ways my exhortation to Germany, um, that you, you guys have a leading role. Um, you can't, you've seen what's happened in the United States, and even if, and it's a big if, Trump loses and Biden comes in, some of the trends, I mean, the, the, the manner of diplomacy will completely change, we'll lose all the boorish insults that, that um, Trump has meted out on, on Merkel, and on Germany in general. Um, but the basis of American foreign policy isn't going to change. The American gradual withdrawal from Europe will continue. Kind of, It's down to you guys, uh, Americans, to, to Europeans. And so, yeah, this is the time for Germany to step up. And will the younger generation that um, both feels passionately in an emotional sense, um, either pacifism or um, non-aggression 
Um, but will it take some really, really hard decisions with authoritarianism and populism on the rise? It's the, exactly the right question that um, David poses. When uh, Germany did send troops um, into action for the first time, famously uh, Joschka Fischer, when Germany did that uh, in Kosovo in the late 1990s, he had to, he chose to invoke the Holocaust and Auschwitz by saying um, that there is a massacre taking place in that country and we cannot look ourselves in the eye and not intervene. And somebody said to me uh, in my conversations for the book, which I quote, um, you will know that Germany has really grown up in foreign policy when we don't have to invoke the Holocaust or the war. And we can simply, in a calm, measured, effective, sensitive way, say we have to do this, guys. And it could be military, it could be sanctions, it could be all kinds of things. But no, I, I totally agree. This is Germany's weakest spot. I go into it. I think my chapter on foreign policy is by far the most critical. Um, we have a question from uh, Jürgen Meyer. He says he's the ex-CEO of Siemens UK. When we discussed your book, you were researching the role business takes with regard to society, i.e. in Germany, there being a stronger social purpose, and that this creates a better culture and cohesion between politics, business, and society. What did your research in this area show? Um, and uh, Jürgen puts racket, he openly admits, I haven't read the book yet, but he says yet, yet, and yet. He's about well, to Jürgen, so. Jürgen is somewhere on holiday in Austria if I remember from our email exchange. And hello, Jürgen, um, and, and thanks very much um, for your question. And again, all you should do all the disclaimers, first of all. There's some terrible bad practice in Germany. Um, uh, boards tend to be sort of gentlemen's clubs and, and board roles get divvied up between people. Uh, terrible corruption, we saw that uh, with Wirecard, which the FT brilliantly exposed, and actually some of the German media was reluctant to cover it to begin with. Uh, and most famously, we've seen it with VW and the emissions um, scandal. So uh, there are a lot of problems with the way Germans, uh, Germany's business runs. But the co-determination, the um, uh, willingness, almost the uh, obligation that um, bosses, that CEOs, feel to include workers' representation on their executive boards, uh, on their advisory boards, is really something to behold. And it's very smart because not only does it produce far fewer strikes, but it but it produces an, a, a very strong element of buy-in. It's very hard for unions to, to sort of diss something a company's gone, if, done if, if they've been privy to uh, the decision making. Um, and across the piece, there is a, a much greater sense of uh, the, the German phrase mitmachen, sort of get stuck in, let's all do it together, um, which is also a phrase they use in sort of football five-a-side pitches as well. Um, just sort of get involved. And you get that sense with the with German companies, particularly the middle ranking ones, the Mittelstand, of um, a real sense of paternalistic um, involvement in their medium-sized towns. You know when you travel across France, across Britain, across Spain, elsewhere, you just see swathes of towns that have pretty much collapsed and have been left to um, uh, sort of wallow uh, on their own. And there are some in Germany, and obviously there are issues with the former GDR, but you very much get a sense of so many towns where there's one or two companies that are global players in some niche market, but also they're very strongly involved in the way the town is run. And whether it's sponsoring the football team, the music team, the carnival practice, whatever it is, there's much more of that sort of sense of social cohesion, which I think is really strong. Um, which is very interesting then to have a look at the more than one million refugees um, and asylum seekers that came and, and how that 
you know, how, how that has affected uh, German society. But I want to give you another question, Lucy. I want, I want to go off and ask you lots of questions. Stephanie Bolson has a question for you. Hi, John. Do you really think you'll reach those you would like to reach with your book, i.e. pro-Brexit conservatives, some of them possibly a bit anti-German, or will you rather achieve the opposite with your book? Hi, Stephanie. Um, uh, Steffi, by the way, um, is the Develt correspondent in London and is a, is a superstar. And um, she helped me uh, with the book. Um, the, um, the, the, the only negative review I got, which was pretty spectacular, was Simon Heffer in The Telegraph. Um, and I was both amused by it, but also deeply saddened by it. It was a sort of, but, it, but what it really left me with was a total sense of vindication. I'm not trying to be arrogant here, but it is simply there are just some people in this country who are so dyed in the wool that they just don't get it. They do genuinely think that, that whether or not we sing Land of Hope and Glory in the proms is kind of more important than whether we have enough PPE in our hospitals or, or whatever. They, this sort of sense of Britain ruling the waves and we were wonderful once and just because we were wonderful once we uh, we we should be again and this is not emphatically not an anti-conservative point in all my different jobs of journalism running the creative industries and whatever i've worked with all the uh, conservative governments and with a number of ministers and secretary of state and got on with them very well there is something fundamentally different with what we are facing now which is a um and it's, I know for you, Katty, you, you can't, uh, you know, you just have to have a richest um, face on this in terms of moderating. But it, we have a government that um, is in a Trumpian way um, falling back on a culture. It's not a war. It's a sort of culture skirmish in order to apply balm on the fact that pretty much everything that they are doing in an administrative function is collapsing uh, whether it is the administration of schools and whether or not schools should go back whether it's all this issues around health our almost complete marginalization now in foreign policy our gdp is collapsing 21 percent against germany's still bad 10 percent and my exhortation uh, is sure engage disagree with me as much as you like uh, and i'm sure i've got things wrong and I, a lot of criticisms totally legitimate but deal with the here and now deal with the present and deal with the future the past we can celebrate once a year twice a year ve day um remembrance sunday absolutely and with enormous respect for 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 the war dead but we have to live in the present and the future. And the, what so upsets me about this country is how many people just simply think a reference to the past will get us through, and it won't. Um, I wonder, you know, sometimes in a discussion about politics and modern politics, you'll hear the point made that uh, the UK, whether um, it was uh, in the 20th, mid 20th century uh, or, or whether now when there's been, you know, austerity and gaps widening between rich and poor, you don't have people flocking to the far right. Mm -hmm. Germany had saw a rise in support for the AFD on the back of the migration crisis and the country taking in over over a, a million people. I just um, want to uh, point here to uh, uh, here it is. Sorry, Alberta von Boss, Executive Director, ISD Germany. John, you said Germany would be the linchpin to protect liberal democracy, and I share that opinion for several reasons. However, we've seen a radicalization on the far right that is spinning out of control. Do you feel that government, society, the judiciary and media are stepping up enough? Good question. And by the way, I'm completely obsessed with your cat, Katia. Oh, so which cool. one can you see? I've got three. So, oh, that's so cute. And that's, um, door is looking that's, at your cat. that's Ga Gandalf. Gandalf. Hello, Gandalf. Yeah. And I yeah. hope you like the book too. I'm interested in your comments. <laughs> of course. Um, the, a lot of this comes down to electoral system. Sorry to be boring here for a second, but in countries that have a proportional system, you will have a uh, salami slicing of 
uh, political affiliations from the far left to the far right and everything in between. And that's why countries like Germany um, have permanent coalitions of two, three, sometimes four parties. Um, uh, because you don't have these two umbrella parties, uh, Conservative and Labour, and with a fairly hollowed out uh, Liberal Democrat Party in the middle, and obviously you have a different politics in, in, in Scotland and particularly in Wales and in Northern Ireland. Um, so you will, all, you will have that. Um, there is a far right um, constituency, I would argue, in every country in the world. Um, the Germany has its 5% barrier um, and the AFD has absolutely smashed that barrier everywhere in every uh, state and in the federal parliament. Um, am I worried about the AFD and the many Germans on this uh, um, event uh, know about this far more than I am? Um, absolutely. And, and we should all be as well. Um, the, uh, and I absolutely take a very hard line that one should not apologize for, make allowances for, habituate for or to um, uh, the pernicious politics of the far right. Um, I hope and I trust that, and a lot of Germans say this to me in opinion polls appear to bear this out, that the AFD may have hit its high watermark. Uh, but it will probably, for a very long time, continue to represent 10 or 15 percent of the German population uh, and, uh, and 20 plus percent of the population, in, uh, including in, that, in, in the eastern states. Um, I can only, this politics of grievance still has a lot of, uh, of mileage but I'm not under any illusions. What happens in our country is that the far right and the far left get absorbed into the mainstream parties. It's interesting you say that because I, I, I agree with you that I think the FT has reached a kind of a, it's reached its, its sort of, yeah, watermark at the moment for now anyway. And I think you can see that across Europe that, you know, the Lega in, in Italy or the Daniels People's Party or, or so on. I think though that that is because some of those more uh, extreme views or sort of you know breaking what previously were social taboos like looking at migration and uh, globalization and questioning the benefit for society you seeing a lot of mainstream parties adopting those you know those talking points which is bringing people away um, probably from from the extremes it's it, i mean it's very interesting to to watch it happen yeah. Ulrike Franke says um, have you thought and this is interesting about the different generations in Germany have you thought about how the title will be received in Germany personally I worry a bit that this book title plays into Germans and in particular German Millennials my own generation mm -hmm. smugness about Germany that's not mine by the way I'm ancient but um, this is uh, Ulrike um, because there is a sense in Germany that we really do things better and that we're morally superior because we've been so good at coming to terms with history just wondering whether this is something you've thought about. I'm very much looking forward to reading the book, she says. Hi, Ulrika, and Ulrika um, was, was, was great to talk to um, as well. Um, oh, oh boy, have I thought about it. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, do our Germans, yeah, of course you'll find smug people um, uh, who think they, they do it better. There is a sort of, um, in fact, Ulrika was saying this to me, I think, when we, and I, and I either quote her directly or indirectly in the book, as saying there is a smugness that comes out of not having fought wars, and a smugness that, it's almost a sort of um, a moral nationalism through, through pacifism or through, through non-militarism. Um, and, yeah, that, that is a concern, but... Ultimately, I just go back to what I said originally, and I do think there, uh, maybe it's hope over expectation, there is a sense that um, it is time for, for Germany to, to step up. Um, and, um, you know, all I'm trying to do with the book and with the title, um, and it, as I said in my introductory thoughts, Gadget, you know, it, this is what matters to me over the next 12 months and I want to be involved in all kinds of discussions and events and newspaper things and TV, radio things, whatever, whatever you want, is just a discussion about 
who who is there out there that is really going to take a stand for liberal democracy and it'd be brilliant if the brits could do it and not just do it in rhetoric but set an amazing example and everybody else the french the americans uh, and let's see what biden does if if biden wins but the germans are absolutely in pole position and they can either sit there cocooned or they can step up john we have tons more questions for you but since we're talking about germany punctlichkeit mm, so punctuality is very important, very important so um i feel a need to bring proceedings to a close but because i can and this is very mean to everyone who's got their questions so i'm sorry but i'm going to ask you one more question myself <laughs> but it's a brief answer that i think we can we've got a few seconds left Right. Do you think Angela Merkel will be tempted to stay as Chancellor uh, after 2021, even though she's ruled it out officially? Not if she's got any sense. Um, because she, partly I just think she's quite, I'm not trying to sort of eulogise her, but I think she's got her head screwed on. She's, she's got her historical, you know, she, uh, a year ago, or even six months ago, people were saying she was beyond her sell-by date, uh, the Merkel Demerung, you know, was all the rage and, you know, we've had enough of her and Germany's slowed down. It's all a bit dull and boring. We need a new injection of, of life. And then COVID happened and she's absolutely cemented her reputation in posterity. And as with football managers, as, as with leaders, you get out when you're on top. And I have no sway on, on her, on Mutti. But if she asked me my opinion, I would say you've got another year um the cdu her party will have its a party conference in december it will choose its leader or maybe its bavarian sister party will choose it for it um and choose choose their leader but either way there will be that and the social democrats will have their candidate and who knows what the greens will do they were riding high they seem to have gone down let's see let's see what happens but it's really really interesting but whatever happens there will be a new election next september october um, and there will be a new coalition and there will be a new start and it always takes about a month or so for coalitions to finish their meticulous negotiations and then she will go off and my hunch is because she's a total atlanticist which is what makes the trump insults towards her so uh unspeakable is that she will get some lovely perch at harvard or somewhere and um, give lots of and, and write a much better book and will give lots of lectures about um, who knows what or she may even go back into science or she may just she loves the arts she may just spend some more time there she might write a book with you who knows but um, it'll be very interesting to see whether the world's perception of Germany changes radically with the departure of Mutti um, yeah. but for and now a massive task for her successor to step into yeah. her Absolutely. John Kampfner, um, author of Why the Germans Do It Better, Notes from a Grown-Up Country. Thank you. It was really interesting to talk to you this Thank evening. Thank you, Katia. Thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you to all the folk at Atlantic and to all of you who I can just see in my green button, uh, wherever you are in Germany, Britain or elsewhere. Thank you so much for, for listening and do spread the word about this book because, and I hope you enjoy it. And even if you don't and if you want to criticise it, Go ahead, please do, and just engage. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you, Katia. Okay. Bye-bye. From Brussels. Bye-bye. <laughs>